Hello, this is Michelle. Jesus is my rock and that's how I roll. Um, I wanted to share a few things um, today. I don't usually even think about this much anymore because this was so many years ago. But um, I think it would apply to, uh, might mean something to people today that are dealing with this because uh, psychedelic drugs and all kinds of different drugs are becoming popular on the streets today and they're, from what I hear, more harmful than ever. Um, there's some things I never had to deal with uh, or even worry about, like fentanyl. But anyhow, um, when I was 15 was when I first got introduced to marijuana. It was actually when I was visiting Texas and living in California, um, Colorado. And in Colorado, I didn't really have many friends, and um, it was just not a place I did many drugs, um, or had never done them and, um, until this happened. And so I went to visit Texas in the summer, and uh, went to visit people I already knew, and then uh, met new people I hadn't met before that were my age, and went to the school that I had gone to when I lived there before. And uh, anyhow, I had read about marijuana in Time Magazine or Life Magazine or something, and they made it sound so scary. And I told uh, one of my new friends in Texas, I said, well, he asked me what I thought about it, about marijuana. And I said, well, I wouldn't want to decide until I tried it for myself. And unbeknownst to me, he, uh, in a a group of friends all smoked it a lot together. So I was invited and I smoked it for the first time. And um, I was really surprised because I kind of expected a much stronger experience because I had been led to believe that it was just a, more, a lot more intense than it really was. And um, so I thought, oh, well, this is no big deal. That's how I felt about it. It was, um, to me, it seemed almost similar to how you, somebody might think when they first start drinking, like if they're not drinking way too much. And so I thought, well, then I got offered to drop some acid, also known as LSD. And uh, the friend I was staying with, she wanted to share it with me, but she wanted to go to sleep and she knew I'd be up by myself just me in the stereo. So she was very careful, and I am forever appreciative of that. She's very careful to make sure that she didn't give me too much, that it was a nice small amount. And um, so that night, you know, when you take LSD, it lasts at least eight hours. There's no, you know, coming down before eight hours. And um, for me, it was a very different and pleasant experience in that um, it was just so different and it felt so it almost felt kind of heavenly it just because it was just like being very much in the moment and and just feeling awed by everything around me and um, and I liked that and I remember thinking about it while I was experiencing it that night and thinking, you know, I'd like to live in this experience that I was having that night. But I thought to myself, no, this is too much like heaven. And if I could get to heaven just by taking a pill, I would know that I was stealing it, that I would be coming in through the wrong way and it can't be a good thing. So I promised myself that night that I would never do LSD again. I did not keep that promise, but that was my first experience and also my most mild experience and my only truly quote unquote positive experience with LSD. And um, later that night I entertained myself by listening to Led Zeppelin, which at the time I had no idea, but of course I know now how uh, the uh, I think it was Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin 
was very much into the occult and even bought Aleister Crowley's old house, I believe in Scotland. And um, he even later opened his own occult bookstore just so that he could more easily get a hold of occult books. So that's kind of interesting because um, it's clear that the enemy, Satan, and demons work through music a lot. They, it helps them to get to you. If I think um, a lot of the music back at first, when I was first listening to rock and roll, it was not obviously demonic in any way, as far as I could tell. And I didn't know anything about occult symbols or, you know, almost anything that was a double entendre just went right over my head. I was extremely naive about a lot of things. But um, anyhow, um, after I experienced that and went back to um, Colorado, is when I really first started experiencing um, some demonic things in my life. Not much, but a little bit. Um, it was also tied in with the fact that I was experimenting with the occult and that I was learning from what were so-called, I don't know if they were yogis or, or they were people from the East that um, I would search in old bookstores and learn about astral projection and um, I wanted to do it. And I think I actually did experience it once for just a few moments and um, and then went right back into my body. Um, then I got another book about astral projection that warned a person that if you do go on the astral level, there are um, little demons there that will purposely try to scare you. And that's all I needed to hear. I didn't want to practice astral project anymore. So I was, I'm really grateful and thankful that I ran into that very obscure book at some old used bookstore. Anyhow, um, I ended up wanted to try mescaline, which I heard was like LSD, but much softer, not, not so bad, not so, well, not so bad, whatever. And I had apparently totally forgotten my promise to myself to not try to to get to higher states through pills. And um, a friend at work, a casual acquaintance at work, gave me something that her boyfriend had given her. We both took it at work, which was like, it was like an Arby's, but a privately owned and had a different name. And we both immediately got diarrhea and felt very sick and had to call our parents. And I, at least I had to call my parents because I. I didn't drive yet. I was actually still 15. I lied and said I was 16 to get the job. And, um, and she went home also. I think we just had to close down the shop that night. And um, I had a very scary experience. It was almost like coming close to dying. And later from what I could understand is probably that there had been a lot of strychnine added to it because the entire eight to eight to 10 hours, I was like, <gasps> you know, I just, it was very hard to breathe. And it's actually the only time that I hallucinated on, uh, on drugs. It's odd, it's, it's funny how us as individuals are different and uh, I'm sure there are other people like me, I just haven't met any, but um, other than moving your hand and seeing it like blah, 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 other than that, that sort of thing. I never hallucinated on LSD. Except that night, it, I later learned that it was not mescaline. It was a six-way trip of LSD, which meant it was really enough for taking it three times at least. And um, I was seeing some hallucinations, like the doorknob moving around when I was trying to open the door, or a picture on the on the wall of Paul McCartney's eyes were rolling down like a waterfall into the, into the floor. That was really bizarre. And um, it's actually the only time I remember ever hallucinating. 
anyway, that was a very scary night for me. And um, I, I look back and it's just so interesting to see how, of course I quit taking uh, psychedelics for quite a while after that. And I didn't have uh, a lot of friends had very few friends, I did not smoke marijuana very often either. Um, it just wasn't a focal point of my focus. Um, but I look back and I see that that's when I first became suicidal. I was suicidal for about three years in my teenagehood. I just really, really wanted to kill myself. and. I had never really liked living in this world for the most part. I had had a childhood that was pretty unhappy, um, where basically our mother, me and my brother, were abandoned by our mother when, uh, when I was um, eight years old and uh, only saw her once or twice between that time and 10. And I saw her one more time when I was 16 and she had to sneak because with her new husband, she was not allowed to see me and I was not allowed to write her or call her. And all of that, I lived with my dad because she had given custody of us back to him when she, when her new boyfriend that she married uh, told her that he didn't want to take care of someone else's kids. And, um, so anyhow, when my dad was just very busy with his own problems and his job, and, and I was pretty much left to my own devices uh, most of my childhood, and, um, well, I felt very unlove, unlovable. I felt like I was unloved, and I was unloved because I was unlovable, and um, uh, it's one of the reasons I got so much into the occult, which I didn't think of so much as the occult. I thought of it as finding out the truth. <laughs> That's how I got into reincarnation and all of that stuff, trying to explain, trying to explain to myself what's going on. And um, I experienced, um, as I got a little bit older, uh, I had did take LSD a few more times and each time it was worse than the time before and each time I would remind myself remember you promised yourself not to do this again why are you doing it again and I remember one I think it was almost it was the second to the last time I ever took LSD and um, I was really upset that I had taken it and so I thought okay I'm going to spend this whole 10 hours or 8 hours figuring out why did I take it so that I can figure out how to keep myself from taking it anymore. And after a great seeking of self-analysis for those eight hours or 10 hours, which actually turned out to be longer than 10 hours, I wasn't expecting it and that's the only time that ever happened, but um, I, I, I finally came to the conclusion that the reason I kept taking LSD even though I know I shouldn't, was because I was looking for love. Um, and I think that was true. It's, I was looking for love in definitely wrong places. And I went to sleep that night, finally, and when I woke up, I was still stoned like on LSD. And that really scared me because I had never had it last longer than eight or 10 hours. And now it had been way more than that many hours. And then it continued all day. I went to sleep the next night, still stoned. And I was very sad because I was afraid that I would be in that state for the rest of my life. I was pretty sure I would be. I was very fortunate that the next morning I woke up and I was back in my normal mind again. Whew. That that was just really, that was really scary. And um, after that I had, um, I had sleep paralysis for a while in several different states. So I, 
because it was in, even happened in different states, I really don't think it was because of a haunted house. I think it was something following me. That was really frightening. Um, and I could tell, sometimes I could, I could, I could almost see that something that was blacker than black right above me and it was like pressing down on my chest and once or twice I could feel like it was trying to pull my soul out of my body um, and I would just spend the whole time trying as hard as I could to scream and um, it would finally come out sounding like a turkey gobble <laughs> and I was somebody who could scream really loud so it was pretty odd that it came out like a turkey gobble but at least that it would finally break and uh, looking at my notes so I don't forget to mention oh yeah and so over time I smoked marijuana more often and I noticed before long that I really didn't like it very much because it made me feel paranoid like I just started having a lot of paranoid thoughts and I didn't normally have and I didn't like that feeling but I felt pressured, I felt peer pressure because other people would say things like, oh, well, you know, people who are mentally unstable, they can't handle smoking grass. We called it grass, we called it pot, we called it weed. That's what we really called it, was those, that was where I lived. We mostly called it grass. And um, I didn't want people to think, that was another fear I started having after I'd gotten interested in the occult at the age of 12. I started having a fear of being insane or going insane. And um, so for other people to think I was crazy because I couldn't handle my marijuana was a big fear of mine. And um, I started smoking it more often, only socially and only so that I could prove I was not crazy. That's pretty crazy. Finally, one day I realized that. Um, didn't realize it for long enough, but I remember rem noticing one day, thinking about it, and I thought, well, Michelle, you don't like it because it makes you feel paranoid. And if you're not gonna listen to yourself before you listen to these other people, then you are crazy. <laughs> and so I kind of got off the marijuana for quite a while later because of a boyfriend I had and because I was a cigarette smoker and because he had an unlimited amount of grass um, I ended up smoking just grass instead of cigarettes for three years and I didn't I did not like it very much but I just learned to live with it and um, anyway so I just wanted to share that um, it's interesting to me that, especially with the LSD, um, it just seemed so beautiful and heavenly. And it was, you know, it's well known. A lot of people say they met God when they um, take LSD. And I can understand why they say that and feel that way. But it's not the real God. It's a false God. It's um, the best liars in the world will show you some truth for you to trust them, but it's the overall, whatever they're teaching you or trying to show you is a lie. And that's exactly how the evil in this world, also known as the devil and his minions, that's how they work. They um, work that way, especially for people who are looking for light. A lot of people who call themselves light workers have no idea who they're really working for because there is a light in this world that is really darkness, such as in the New Age. Well, now that I've got everybody cheered up, <laughs> well, I'll just go on to say that I did end up having LSD one more time many years later, and um, it was not good. I, it was um, the conclusion I came during that very last trip, LSD trip, was I couldn't love others unless I loved myself more. And it was the beginning of a sort of New Age style narcissism that I got into. If it was about, if it was for me, it was me, me, me. This is the deception of the, the evil one, is that 
what we don't realize is if we're not if we're if we're worshiping if we're not worshiping God we are worshiping ourselves that's really what it comes down to and worshiping yourself if you're not worshiping um, I guess I don't know how much I can't get into detail about like people who are Satanists and all of that but by the way I think it's really interesting I just learned that Aleister Crowley was um, brought up in his family as a child by the Plymouth Brethren. Well, I already knew that, but I didn't know, know who the Plymouth Brethren were. And they, they started out in England. Um, apparently a, a large number of their followers were very wealthy. And um, they were actually the beginnings of several different well-known types of um, uh, doctrines, so-called doctrines that are taught today in the United States. One was um, prosperity gospel. I think they were the first, as far as I know, they were the first known quote-unquote Christian church to um, teach that if you were prosperous, then that was proof that you were on God's good side. And then it was, it, it got so that um, in even more recent times, I saw a testimony of a guy online the other day who had been in the Plymouth Brethren and he was in a very bad auto accident and they just decided that that was because he was not right with God and he got shunned for having an accident and nearly getting killed. I think that's just the craziest and most cruel thing in the world. Well anyway, so there are, there are some who call themselves Christians who will judge other people by how much money they have or how prosperous they are or whether they're in accidents or not, um, which is just ridiculous and there's none of that is in the Bible. Sometimes God does um, prosper those who follow him, but it's not a sign that you, it's the, when Jesus came, he was talking to mostly poor people and um, it wasn't about, I mean, he himself, he even said at one part of the Bible that he didn't even have a place to lay his head to sleep. He was um, something next to homeless himself. Anyhow, um, although he was welcome at many people's houses, I'm sure. Anyway, um, the Plymouth Brethren also started the uh, belief in the rapture and along with a couple other denominations and um, John Nelson Darby was one of the founders of that group and they also were the first ones to teach um, grace the, the ones who the greasy grace where it's like you know once you believe in Jesus don't worry about sinning you have grace now as long as you believe in Jesus you're good to go and um, no worries about making sure not to sin anymore. And that's really, I mean, that's why the Bible is so important so that we can stay on the path which Jesus told us is very narrow and a lot of people don't find it. So, you know, that's where it is. It's in the Bible. And um, uh, I just wanted to connect. The main thing I wanted to connect here was that I see when I look back how my suicidal tendencies and great depression, great, great depression that I had for many years, uh, I didn't shake the depression off anything as, as quickly as I shook off the suicidal. All that I see came in the heels of taking psychedelic drugs. And so that's just a warning. and. Also wanted to mention, oh yeah, I'm glad I remember. Um, I just saw a really nice testimony and it's on um, Ryan Reese's YouTube channel and Reese is spelled R-I-E-S and Ryan is R-Y-A-N. And um, there's one of the titles of one of his videos is Sean, S-E-A-N, McKeon, that's M-C, K-E-E-H-A-N testimony. Um, Ryan and 
Sean knew each other in high school. So a little bit of uh, Ryan's testimony ends up in that story too. But it's if you want to hear a testimony of somebody who's done a lot of drugs and a whole lot more than I ever did, um, and how that affected his life, and how they, and then how he came to Jesus, it's just a fascinating and an inspiring testimony. And I'm going to put a link to that video in the description today. Wishing you all a beautiful day, a beautiful night, and Jesus is my rock, and that's how I roll. It doesn't want to turn off. <laughs>